Good evening and welcome to the Augusta Civic Center and the annual meeting of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce and the first televised candidate forum of the 2014 campaign for Governor of Maine. Let's meet the candidates. The independent is Elliot Cutler. He is an attorney, a businessman, and a former staffer for Maine Senator Edmund Muskie. Cutler has never held elective office. The Republican is Governor Paul LePage, who is seeking his second term in the Blaine House. He is a former mayor of Waterville and most recently worked as general manager of the chain of Marden stores across Maine. The Democrat is Mike Michaud. He is finishing his sixth term in Congress representing Maine's second district. He is a longtime legislator and a former president of the Maine State Senate and a former paper mill worker in Millinocket. Please welcome the candidates. Over the next hour, I will be posing questions to the candidates. Uh, we won't be running a stopwatch on this, uh, but we will try to let everyone have a say, and if things run too long, I'll step in to keep things moving. Uh, they will be able, allowed to engage one another. If someone makes a claim about them, they'll be able to respond to that. And if get my attention, we'll make sure everyone has their say. Uh, this should allow us to have a substantive discussion on as many issues as possible. The candidates will be given an opportunity to pose a question to each of their opponents later in the hour. And each man will have one minute for a closing statement. The lots were drawn to determine the order, and wouldn't you know, it came out alphabetically anyway. Uh, and if you would like to be involved in the social media conversation, we'll also be live tweeting the forum in the next hour using the hashtag MEPolitics. So let's begin. We are about to hire a leader for Maine for the next four years. Elliot Cutler, uh, though you have run before, you are something of a mystery to some people here in the state of Maine. I'm not sure you've managed anything in the last 34 years that they could identify easily. So tell us why you should be the next governor of Maine. First of all, thank you, Pat, and thank you to the State Chamber for having this debate. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. I've spent a career in both the public sector and the private sector, managing businesses, starting successful businesses, working in the White House, working for Ed Muskie, helping to write Maine's, helping to write America's environmental legislation, and helping to manage $160 billion of government spending. I understand management. I understand politics. I understand public service. And I understand the state of Maine. I grew up in Bangor, uh, and my parents and my grandparents were in Bangor. I think that the next governor of Maine needs to have a vision for the state, a plan, and a strategy. I've written a book called The State of Opportunity that explains what I do and why I do it. We need someone who can take Maine into the 21st century, into a 21st century economy with 21st century ideas. Governor LePage, the people of Maine have come to know you well over the last four years. One of the things they know is that you can be highly partisan and sometimes unwilling to work easily with those who disagree with you. Given that, why should you be the governor for the next four years? Well. I think uh, my critics say that, and unfortunately, we need less critics and more role models. And, and in the last four years, uh, let's just take the last two years, and my opponents say that uh, I don't work well with them. When you have good public policy, I work with you. If you try to get me to do bad public policy, it goes in the garbage. I don't have time. But let me tell you this, in the last two years, with a Democratic-controlled legislature, over 80 percent of the bills that came across my desk are now law. Out of those 80-plus percent, two-thirds of them were sponsored by Democrats. On the other hand, of all the bills that I sent up to the legislature, 54 percent died in committee. Now, who's working with who? Congressman Michaud, you have no actual executive management experience of your own to bring to this job. Uh, why are you the best person to lead our state for the next four years? Thank you very much, uh, Pat, for having us here. And I want to thank the Maine State Chamber uh, as well for hosting this uh, event this evening. As most of you know, I'm not the most uh, entertaining orator. Uh, I'm more of a listener and a problem solver. I've done that during my tenure in the Maine legislature as well as a member of Congress. The reason why I'll make the best governor here in the state of Maine is I have the vision that I laid out my Maine May plan. I have the experience working in the legislature on the Appropriation Committee as President of the Senate, the evenly divided Senate. 
uh, and uh, the 12 years in, in Congress. And I know how to bring people together. If we're going to solve problems here, whether it's working with the legislature, Republicans and Democrats and independents, or whether it's working with special interest groups, we're able to get the issue uh, uh, solved uh, in the legislature. So I'd be a better governor uh, and I'd make a great governor for the state of Maine. Governor LePage. Yeah, I, I would just like to, to say that in the last 12 years as a congressman, you have voted 93 percent the way Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic leaders have asked you to vote. That's not crossing the, that's not working both lines. If you look at what's happening in Maine, as much as you say that I don't work with others, two-thirds of the bills that went into to, uh, law under your party's control you brought up, your party brought up. Congressman? Yes, uh, I'm very glad that uh, Leader Pelosi and my colleagues in Congress have been able to accept some of the ideas that I brought forward so I can actually vote for the bill. You look, for instance, the, under the Affordable Care Act. That was legislation that I was not supporting until we actually took care of the reimbursement rates uh, under the Medicaid population. The, you know, the cap and trade legislation, because the Maine has uh, the, the Reggie program, but one of the issues I did with the cap and trade legislation, we actually were able to enhance what Maine has already been doing for quite some time. And it's about working across the aisle to get things done. It's not about making headlines. Mr. Cutler? Do you really want four or eight more years of this? <laughs> really? If we keep arguing with each other in this state of a million three hundred thousand people that's all the size of greater buffalo new york if we keep arguing with each other which party's doing this which party's doing that who's a better partisan than the other if we keep doing that we are not going to pull ourselves out of an eleven year nosedive that maine's economy has been in through eight years of a democrat and now three, almost four years of a Republican. We don't need more of this. Last word for Governor LePage, quickly. Yeah. In the last four years, I've reduced the structural gap by 60 percent. Largest tax cut in Maine history. We've created 22,000 jobs. Wish it would have been 60. However, I couldn't budge one area, and that's energy. The Democratic Party is stuck in not reducing energy cost. Besides that, we paid off a debt to hospitals, $750 million. We never had to raise taxes. The last two years, we balanced the budget. We closed the year with a surplus. And incidentally, this last year, $94 million surplus. The tax increase by the Democrats generated $90 million. We balanced, we didn't have to take $90 million out of Maine people this last year. Governor, let me ask you, and, and, and it, it jumps off of what you were just saying. You've said you want to focus on jobs that pay $50 an hour, not minimum wage jobs. Have you brought any $50 an hour jobs to the state in the last four years? Where are they, if they are, or if yeah, not, why yeah. not? A absolutely. We've brought many doctors to the state of Maine that make much more than that. Jackson Lab right now, we were there this week, just in the last week. Just in the last week, I went, the last 12 days, we've had over 12 ribbon cuttings. We've had over hundreds of millions of dollars invested in here, and we are currently working on some jobs that are going to be paying exactly that. With all benefits in, $50 is not a high-paying job. Uh, Congressman Michaud, you have virtually ignored Elliot Cutler in the earlier debates you've had uh, so far. Can you tell us why you think you'd be a better governor than him and on what issue do you most differ with Elliot Cutler? I think uh, I'll be a better governor than my two opponents are up here on stage uh, because I do have the vision on how to uh, move this state forward in a very positive way. I have the experience, as I mentioned earlier. The governor talks about paying back the hospitals, but what he's not talking about is the fact that he use a credit card to pay them back. I would have paid the uh, hospitals back, but it would have been cash. The thing that the governor doesn't talk about was the fact that uh, because he's not accepting the expansion under the Medicaid, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, hospitals are actually going to lose anywhere from 75 
a million to $100 million. So he's paying them back with a credit card over here, but the Maine Hospital Association said that uh, that's how you differ with the governor. That's uh, how you differ with the governor. How do you differ from Mr. Cutler? Well, I, I differ uh, with, with Mr. Cutler because I do have the experience of be, de being able to work across the aisle. Uh, Mr. Cutler talks about what he would have done in his experience. He doesn't have a voting record. Uh, I do have a voting record, and I do have that, that experience. And when the governor talks about the uh, uh, given the largest tax cut, but, but he's not mentioned, actually, when I was in the Maine legislature, uh, we actually at that point in time gave the largest tax cuts in the state's history. The difference being is we actually paid for them. The governor never paid for them. What the governor did in his budget uh, when he did those tax cuts, so that the bulk of them went into effect outside the budget cycle, uh, let me, is let me he shifted the cost back onto the municipality. Let's wow. hear from the governor on that. Okay. Number one, in 2001, when Congressman Michaud was president of the Senate, there were zero tax breaks to the business. In 2002, when Rick Bennett was president of the Senate, there were tax cuts given. However, right after the election, Governor Angus King called them in and repealed them so they never took effect. Mike, I'm sorry, that is not true, bingo. Number one. Number two, that when he says off budget, I don't understand. We've corrected him several times. We, the tax cut came in the 2011 budget, Mike. We paid it with, with revenues that we, new revenues that we're gonna get in future times, I agree. But I don't understand the credit card. And if you were, I will ask you one question. If you were gonna pay with cash, where would you have gotten the cash, number one? But let's talk about Medicaid right Go now. Governor, let me interrupt for one second, because Elliot Cutler wants to get into this. The question yeah. was originally about him. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want him to have a moment okay. to, to I'd address I'd like this. to go back on <clears throat> Medicaid we expansion. Will. Mike, I'm glad I don't have your record. Me too. <laughs> You've crossed a lot of aisles. You've crossed a lot of aisles. You voted over 17 years, 19 times in the legislature against equal rights for all Mainers. And the last time you were the only Democrat to join four Republicans in voting no on the day it passed. Is that an example of crossing the aisle? Is that really an example of crossing the aisle? Congressman, now, I think you want me, to respond. I want to go, I want to, if well, I that, Actually, that deserves a response, I think. We'll get All back. All right, go ahead. Well, I want to respond first to the governor on the budget. He doesn't understand uh, how the budget, what the governor did was he did those huge tax cuts in one budget cycle. The effect of the biggest part of that uh, tax cuts when in effect outside the budget cycle, so we didn't have to uh, pay for them at that point in time. Then when it came time to pay for them, he eliminated municipal revenue sharing. That's that <laughs> cost shifting uh, that this governor has talked about. And I can understand why he might not understand that process because he was refused to submit a supplemental budget to the legislature. Well, let, let's get back to uh, Mr. Cutler is being critical of you essentially, I think, for changing your position on several issues, including abortion, uh, gay rights, and so forth. So how do you respond to that charge? Uh, when I started in the Maine legislature, I was 24 years old at the time. And growing up in a large Franco family, a very rural part of the state of Maine, at that point in time, the reason why I ran for the legislature, it was because of the jobs, the economy, and the environment. I wasn't focused on the social issues. And since then, I've had a great opportunity, particularly in Congress, uh, to actually to hear the personal stories of women who had to make that personal choice whether or not to have an abortion or not. And that those stories really were heartfelt stories. And yes, I have evolved on that issue. But what is wrong with evolving? You, and you look at the LGBT issues. When they did uh, a 30-year uh, anniversary of Charlie Howard in Bangor, I went back, so they, they were uh, going to interview me. And I went back and read the newspapers at that time. 
And the Bangor Daily News actually editorialized on the Charlie Howard murder. And it insinuated that he was asking for it. And you look at the stories during that time frame. And yes, the legislature did pass legislation, which I voted for that legislation. And at that point in time, the legislature, we thought we were moving forward Mr. in a Cutler, pro is, progressive is way. But come to find out, we really wasn't. And I know Mr. Cutler is upset because of a quality main in HRC, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood, and NARAL. They looked at my history of voting records, and I received their endorsements because they know that I'm the candidate for governor that will run this state in a deficient way over the next uh, four years. Is it a bad trait for a governor to change his mind? No, and I'm glad that Mike's evolved on, on women's reproductive rights and on so many issues that are core issues for so many people, but he's not being honest. He's not being honest with the people of Maine. He's pretending that he cast those votes when he was 24 years old. The fact is that he cast those votes when he was 24, 34, 44, and even 54 years old. It took him nearly 30 years to figure out why women feel so strongly about their bodies and about their rights. And he says he's the only person on this stage, because he said it before we were, when we were on the same stage, who's ever cast a pro-choice vote. He's the only candidate with a record. Well, you know something? He's also the only person on this state who's cast 27 years of anti choice votes. He's the only person on this stage who voted to deny abortions for poor people when it was legal for others. He's the only person on this stage who voted to give a zygote, to give a zygote personhood in the eyes of the law. He had to go to Washington, to Washington to learn that he was wrong. Women didn't come to him in Augusta during those years and years and years when he was in the legislature? Mr. Cutler, I'm going to have to interrupt. I, want, I do want to Go move ahead. on uh, from here. <laughs> and I have a question for you. Uh, you have criticized both of your opponents for taking money from special interests. I have. Uh, but your law firm, while you were senior counsel, took in lobbying fees from special interests such as Monsanto and Dow Chemical. How is the money you earned as a client different from money that uh, the governor and Congressman Michaud are receiving for their campaign? You know, Pat, I didn't earn that money uh, because when you're of counsel or senior counsel, you are paid a salary. You're not, you don't have a share in the partnership profits. And I never lobbied for any of those clients, never did any work for any of those clients. This was in a law firm of 900 people. What Mike was doing, and for that matter, what Paul has done, is take their money and then go vote for them. Governor LePage? I don't know you what don't he's talking I didn't vote. No. I didn't vote for you. Water bill thirty thousand. <laughs> are, are you are no, you beholden you to special so interests who have contributed to your campaigns? No. You know, absolutely not. In matter of fact, this year someone was going to do a big fundraiser, and they came in and asked me to do something, and I said, "I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do that." I do not. I'm I'm only beholden to one conscience. It's the one inside of me. I don't not be holding to anyone. I have a great senior staff. They give me great advice, and I take it most of the time, although there are times when I just say no because it's the wrong thing to do. Let me tell you how I look at things. Wrong is wrong, no matter if everyone's doing it. Right is right, no matter if no one's doing it. And I dictate my decisions solely based on my conscience and the direction I get from my staff. Congressman Michaud, uh, over, the, over your career, you've accepted a lot of special interest money. How has that affected you? Yep. It hasn't. My, the bottom line for me, I've always focused in on what's the right thing for the people here in the state of Maine. When I first ran for the legislature, uh, I ran to clean up the Penobscot River. And that was the very mill that I was working at. But I felt strongly about uh, being able to uh, clean up the Penobscot River. As far as uh, money, you mentioned Monsanto and, uh, and some of the money they gave. I don't have the means to write my own check uh, to run a campaign. 
so we have to do a lot of fundraising. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to vote the way those individuals wanted. For instance, on the Monsanto uh, is a good example. I'm a co-sponsor of the uh, GMO labeling bill, which Monsanto is absolutely uh, against. Uh, I, my focus continues to be, and will always be, uh, focusing on what's right for the people here in the state of Maine. Mr. Cutler, is there an example you can give of, sure. of the congressman voting for special interest instead of Maine's interest? You know, in 2002, Mike, you began taking thousands of dollars from Monsanto's PAC. And in 2006, you voted for a bill, H.R. 4167, that would have barred Oakhurst Dairy's label that says no artificial growth hormones because Monsanto didn't like it and had already sued them in Boston to get rid of that language on Oakhurst label because Monsanto makes artificial growth hormones. Uh, Governor, do you have a last word on this? You seem to yeah, want to get in. Yeah, uh, the congressman just made a comment, and I got to hold him to it. He said he makes, he, he casts his votes for the people of Maine. However, the people of Maine have enormously high energy costs. And just two weeks ago, he, for a second time, voted against H.R. 1900, claiming that which would have expedited energy of uh, the expansion of natural gas in Maine. He's voted against it twice. And during that vote, he claimed that he did it because there was eminent domain issues in Massachusetts, there are no eminent domain issues in H.R. 1900. It's not even about eminent domain. And he voted against Maine people. Congressman? Yes, uh, th that's a, a very, I'm glad you brought that up, Governor, because first of all, you have no energy policy, number one. Uh, secondly, I believe in natural gas is a good transitional fuel. And you are correct in that legislation, it does not talk about eminent domain, but however, uh, under the legislation that said they'd have to approve or deny uh, uh, the permit. And by doing so, what it would do was issue, allow an out-of-state corporation to use eminent domain to, for that pipeline. That's under current law. It wasn't in the legislation, but it's under current law, Governor. And that's one of the things, when you look at legislation, you got to look at what might not be in the law, but the effect that it has uh, outside the law, and the governor's just using this uh, as a diversionary tactic <laughs> because uh, the governor is inability to work with the New England governors to deal with the expansion of the pipeline here uh, in, in the state of Maine. And if we're going to have that pipeline, first we have to work with Cutler. other uh, New England governors. First, Mr. Cutler. This is going to surprise everybody. They're both wrong. <laughs> number one, that number doesn't one. surprise us. <laughs> well, you got to listen to this, Mike. You learn something. Number one, the bill, the bill, the bill doesn't give a FERC licensee eminent domain authority. The FERC license gives That's them right. eminent right. domain authority. And number two, the real problem with the bill is that it gives the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, at the end of the day, the authority to make all of the environmental decisions all of the other decisions that any regulatory agency has failed to make. And you know something? That's why Ed Muskie rewrote NEPA before it became law, so that the foxes wouldn't be guarding the chicken coops. All right. uh, we need to move on. Uh, Governor, well, I want to ask but, you. Uh, but, but there's an error here as well. All right, quickly. <laughs> Are you sure? H.R. 1900 only deals with a pre-filing issue. It's, it's just trying to streamline the process. No. All right. Let me, let me, let, uh, I'm, we're going to we're gonna move on. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me ask you, Governor, yesterday in referring to a patient who was at Maine Medical Center in Portland who was being observed for possible Ebola symptoms, after this individual was released, you said, the biggest issue right now is whether or not this individual has proper papers. What did you mean by that? Why is that the most important thing if someone may be hospitalized with an infectious disease in this state? Because my concern is this. When there are three types of ways that a person can come to Maine and uh, from a foreign country, foreign land, legally. And there's obviously, we all know, the ones that are illegal. You can come over as a primary refugee, secondary refugee, or an asylee. Primary refugee and the secondary refugees have medical assessments. 
So we already know their medical condition. An asylee, we do not know. And an asylee, the first thing we want to know is do they have a visa so that we have ways to get back to see if they have a medical assessment. And not everybody in Maine is here legally. As the good congressman will, will tell you that he's against, he's, he favors my position of not providing GA to illegals. Uh, congressman? Any contagious outbreak like this one is a real uh, cause uh, for concern. When you look at what's happening in West Africa, they have a lack of their health care system. Maine cannot solve this problem alone, but Maine can actually play an important role in this issue. The first Ebola, uh, Ebola uh, patient has shown up at the Dallas hospital with a 103 fever at that hospital. Because he had no insurance, they gave him aspirin and sent him on his way. He contacted, he had contact with 50 other individuals. The virus doesn't pick and choose who is infected. Our health care should not pick and choose who we care for. And the fact that this governor has vetoed not once but five times the expansion under the Affordable Care Act, that's reckless, it's wasteful, and it leaves us vulnerable. And that's why uh, uh, when you look at the whole Ebola issue, the reason why they were turned away is they had no insurance. Uh, Mr. Cutler. You know, I don't think any of us here are really worried about a particular individual. It may be that there was or was not a good health assessment made of this particular person. The real issue here is whether the state of Maine is prepared under the guidelines of the Homeland Security Department to deal with problems like this whenever and wherever they occur. And according to the department, we're not ready. Governor? W which department? Homeland Security. Governor. I beg to differ. We are in complete contact with, with the federal government, MEMA and CDC both, NEMA, uh, I mean, NEMA here and CDC in Maine and CDC at the federal level. If they've said that, you're the only one they've said it to. They certainly haven't said it to us because I've been working with them on an almost daily basis. We'll provide you with that. Okay, thank you. Now, to go back to Mr. Michaud's comment about Medicaid expansion, folks, we, along with myself, my staff, and Mary Mayer, the commissioner at DHHS, have been trying to tell the Maine people for a year now that not everybody qualifies for the expansion. Now, we have a letter from CDC, and I had it enlarged so that the camera can get it. Ooh, props. I would, like, I would like the camera to read this. Therefore, parents between 100 and 133 who could be enrolled in the new adult group cannot qualify as newly eligible, and the newly eligible FMAP, which is 100% reimbursement, is inapplicable. Now, the point I try to make here is everybody says, well, even money on the table. The fact of the matter is there's only about 20,000 people of the uninsured that can qualify for the 100%. Now, the other people, the majority of them do, that are above 100% qualify for the exchanges. Now, this opponent, this opponent tell me that we're leaving money on the table and brand, uh, hospitals are going to go broke. If they get insurance, on the exchange, they get commercial insurance subsidized by the federal government, which is a much higher reimbursement rate than Medicaid. So if they go to the exchange and we work at making sure that people at 100% or greater than uh, the federal poverty level, people will have commercial insurance. Quick response on this, please. First from Congressman Michaud. No, no, take a break. Uh, there are 70,000 Mainers who were denied access, of which 3,000 are veterans, because this governor had vetoed the bill. Maine will save over $600 million over a 10-year time frame. Hospitals get a $348 million, and over a 10-year time frame is $3 billion. And the fact that you're covering 70,000 Mainers, for those who do have health care coverage, it actually will help hold down the cost of health care. Elliot Cutler, quick response on this, please. 
The hospitals want Medicaid expanded. The hospitals want you to take the money. These are your friends. These are the people whose debts you paid by selling the liquor business. Now, when they do go back into the red, and most no, we of we brought the liquor business back in. What? Fine. When you you know exactly oh, what just you did. When minor you, detail. When you when you when you see the hospitals in Maine, Paul, going back into the red, and most of them are already there, you don't have another liquor business to sell. Now, there's got to be a reason why the hospitals, along with so many thousands of Maine people, want you want us to take the expanded Medicaid assistance. Gentlemen, that has to be the last word on this. We need to take a break. We will be back with more of our new center voice of the voter coverage of the 2014 race for governor from the Augusta Civic Center and the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back to our new center voice of the voter forum with the three candidates for governor, Elliot Cutler, Paul LePage, and Mike Michaud. We're coming to you tonight from the Augusta Civic Center and the annual meeting of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. At this point, we will let the candidates take over the questioning for one round. Elliot Cutler, if you have a question for one of your opponents. I have a question for the governor. Paul. Yes. One of your TV ads boasts that we've recovered, you've recovered a million dollars in welfare fraud. That's great. Now, what about, I want to talk about corporate welfare. You made a deal with your pals at Kate Street Capital to give them millions in tax credits, state tax credits, so that they'd invest $50 million uh, to save the jobs and create new ones at the East Millinocket Mill. And your press secretary called it one of the most significant achievements of your administration. Eleven months later, the mill closed. More than 200 people lost their jobs. Great Northern is bankrupt again. Hundreds of Maine businesses in the towns of East Millinocket and Millinocket are owed millions of dollars, and Maine taxpayers are on the hook to write checks to Louisiana investors for $16 million in tax credits you gave away for improvements that were never made. Have you ever asked for an audit? Where, where is all the money? Where's the money? Are you afraid to ask where it is? Do you not want to know? Are you afraid to take on corporate welfare as strongly as you've taken on other welfare? Let's let him answer the money. question. The answer to your question is, I'm not afraid to take on corporate welfare. We are investigating the whole thing in Millinocket going back several years. But let me just answer one of your questions. $16 million. One, one thing that you're wrong, they did invest millions into the plant. So the plant infrastructure is actually more valuable today than it was. But that's not even where the real money is. Where the real money is, $40 million in payroll, $120 million in supply of wood, all the wood cutters, and we saved about $9 million in unemployment benefits. So, well, is it a good deal? No. Would I do it again? Yes, because the net bottom line was we got, we're right now about seven million out, but the Millinocket benefit would just short of two hundred million dollars. You know, I've got to say, Paul, if 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 I, I've been in Millinocket, I was there in April, I was there in September. I can't find anyone there who thinks it's a good deal. Uh, Governor, do you have a question for one of your opponents? Yes, I have. Uh, boy, I get so many. <laughs> <laughs> for now, you just get one. Well, I, I, it's a question that that goes to both candidates. It's very simply this. There's a rumor out there, and I'm not sure if it's true, and I'm going to ask Elliot. I'm told that the Democratic Party asked you to run as a Democrat before Mike Michaud announced. So my question is to you, is it true? Yes. And to Mike is, how do you feel about that, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I am the Democratic nominee uh, for governor, so they chose me. Uh, all right. Uh, Congressman Michaud, do you have a question for one of your opponents? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this question's uh, for the governor. Uh, governor, someone's watching us right now is going without life-saving medication because of your five vetoes for the expansion under the Affordable Care Act. Governor, would you be able to look in the camera and tell that person why you felt that they were too costly for care. Okay. The only bill I ever vetoed dealing with medication 
was to bring back the people getting 400% of poverty, elderly getting pensions above $45,000, and having the state pay their, pension, their uh, medication 100%. At no time, at no time, is there a person in the state of Maine today that needs to go without medication. Now, either candidate will say, oh, you didn't expand Medicaid. The expansion of Medicaid, we, I've been trying to explain to them that getting commercial insurance off the exchange is much better than getting Medicaid because Medicaid doesn't cover the cost of medication, of doctor's offices, or of hospitalization. So ultimately, what we need to do is stop worrying about minimums and getting the state going much more prosperous and getting people to earn above 100% of the poverty level. So I will look in the mirror, uh, in the camera, and in the mirror in the morning and say, if you're not getting medications, call my office because we can get you medication. I have a question I'd like all of you to address. We'll begin with Elliot Cutler. According to the USDA, Maine it has the third highest rate of food insecurity in the nation, up from seventh last year, uh, with one in five Maine children experiencing food insecurity. That means 20% of Maine children don't get enough food. How is your administration going to address this? Number one, and I, I found this out just uh, when I was at the Good Shepherd Food Bank uh, several months ago, if there is a surplus quantity of food somewhere in the state of Maine, and there is a food kitchen or a pantry that needs it, there's no database with common access that allows them to share that information so that food can be moved around the state, number one. Number, and we're going to create that. Number two, you know, Maine used to have 6.9 million acres of land under cultivation. Most of that land is now growing goldenrod. We need to have twice as much land under cultivation in the state of Maine, and we need to use our, the food we grow in our schools. We're providing free lunch to an awful lot of kids because they do come to school hungry, and they cannot learn, and we need to do a better job of providing Maine-grown food to those kids. And finally, if it costs more money to make this work, I promise the people of this state that we will find it. Governor? I absolutely agree that there are some kids that go without proper nutrition. And I would tell you, I was one of those kids. I understand poverty because I lived it. And what we need to do, we can have all the software in the world. Folks, what we need to do is we need to get the per capita income in Maine up. We got to get this prosperity up, and there are two major, three major issues that we have to conquer. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lay one down right to the feet of the Democratic Party. In the last four years, every single bill that we send up to lower the cost of energy, which is one of the biggest problems in attracting new companies to Maine, and I hear it daily, I see somebody right in front of me who sold a business, and within a month or two, one line went to Oklahoma, and the big issue was energy. I hear it from Bucksport. I hear it all over. Energy is number one. Our tax structure needs to be revamped. We need to look at ways that we attract investors. Investment capital will go where it is welcomed. Let and me, it will let me, stay where appreciated. Let me ask uh, Congressman Michaud, how do you address the issue of 20 percent of Maine children not getting enough food? Uh, well, first of all, Maine is 50th on the Forbes list for the best, uh, worst place to do business, and we're 47th on economic growth. So under this governor's leadership, we, we have not moved an economic uh, development. Uh, as far as what's happening, Maine's leaving about $10 million on the table at the federal level when you look at children uh, getting uh, food uh, during the summertime. Under my May-May plan, it's my proposal to actually make Maine the food basket for New England. Uh, very excited about it because we have a lot of opportunities here in Maine uh, as well. On day one, I'll be working with the, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, to grant a waiver under the SNAP program. This governor has chosen not to extend the SNAP beyond the three months. And what we're leaving on the table is $15 million. When you look at hunger here in the state of Maine, we have more children living in poverty today than we've ever had. 
more homelessness. Homelessness has went up 26 percent. According to uh, you know, uh, the food bank here, Good Shepherds, Maine is losing out on $15 million a year for SNAP benefits. They are going to have to provide another 5 million meals a year because of the leadership or lack of leadership under Governor LePage's administration, and that's wrong. Governor, your response? My response is this. You cannot help mankind permanently by doing for them what they could do and should do for themselves. Now, that was said in eight, 150 years ago. And what I'm saying here is very simply this. We have people in Maine who want to work, who want to do better, but we, the government, we, Maine government, is inhibiting them on energy, inhibiting them on the way we treat our small business. And I will agree, 25 years ago, there was 150,000 acres of potatoes being grown in Arista County. Now they're about 49,000. Why? Because we make it impossible for the small family farm to survive. We need to look at the bigger picture. Now, with children, this is what happened last year. I vetoed a bill that said the governor of Maine will eradicate hunger by December 31, 2014, with existing resources. So I vetoed the bill. Because what it was saying is all the schools in Maine will open in the summer and feed the children. The problem with that is they don't have the money. Elliot Cutler, you had a response? Well, the governor's half right. The problem is Boy, we have been proving. That is. <laughs> God help us if we give you four more years. <laughs> the, the governor's half right. It's all about the economy. But everywhere I go in the state of Maine, when I ask business owners and managers, why can't you expand? Why can't you grow your business? Some of them talk about energy, not very many. Some of them talk about taxes, not very many. But every single one of them says, I can't find a healthy, trained, and educated younger workforce. That's the challenge in the state of Maine. And Governor, you say that you've created 20, 22,000. The number keeps changing, and I don't think it's going up. It Jobs up in every the state. Day. Not, in the last, not when Bucksport closes. And, and you say you've created 20, 22,000 jobs, and you're proud of that. We're almost last in the country in the number of jobs created in your administration, almost last in income growth, just about last in the number of jobs created since the recession ended. It's like saying the Red Sox had a good year because they won 71 games. Governor? I will just have to say one thing about that. You're dead wrong. We are number one or in the top four in having the largest percentage of our population working. Secondly, we are number eight in the increase in wages in the state of Maine. And we're, if you use a percentage, we're number five. Let's look at it this way. Let me, let me ask you in this way. If, if Maine has recovered about two-thirds of the jobs we lost before the recession, and we didn't have enough good jobs before that, what is it that you can do? What's the most important thing, and each of you, and I'll ask each of you this, that you can do to improve the climate to, dr to draw good-paying jobs? What's the number one priority? Go number ahead. one priority is energy. Number two is right to work. Congressman? Uh, the number one issue we can create jobs here is to fire Governor LePage. Uh, he's the biggest detriment to job growth. And I, I didn't get a chance to respond to the governor when he's talking about small businesses. The legislature, Republicans and Democrats, actually voted on a bond issue, question number three, that's going to be on the ballot this fall, that actually will help small businesses out with the problems that they're facing with, with capital. And this governor had vetoed it. And thank God the legislature was able to override uh, that veto, and I do support uh, question number three on the on the bond. As far as how we're going to grow the economy under my May May plan, I talk about how we're going to grow it by focusing on small businesses. If Maine was able to grow just at the national average, that's 31,000 jobs here over a 10-year time frame. 
The Maine Technology Institute actually said when you look at the job growth area potential here in the state of Maine, that job growth area is actually in clean, renewable energy, and these are good paying jobs. Yet well, this come, governor let me, let me has get you in on this. Uh, stood in the way for offshore wind and solar. As what well. do I give Mike a little more time top, to answer? Top priority. Top priority without question is education. Uh, I'm a parent, like many of you. I want every kid in the state of Maine to be trained and educated so that he or she can have a job, take a job in a growing and expanding business or even a new business in the state of Maine. And we're not doing that today. Too many of our kids are graduating from high school and going nowhere after that. We have to change that. It is the single most important job we have to do. If we're here four years from now, still talking about the governor's efforts to get Hydro-Quebec to sell us cheaper energy, we are going to have the same kind of economic record we have today. Governor? Two things here that I must respond. Number one is I have got a program, a pilot program. We've been trying to work with, with the university, I mean with the uh, legislature. We have one of the greatest programs going on in the state of Maine without the help of the legislature in Fort Kent, Maine. We have got 24 kids that graduated from high school and one had finished a year and a half of college, 17 finished their freshman year of college, and six out of the 24 got a semester of college. We have some programs that can work. The problem with Maine, not enough money of the, of the education budget goes into the classroom. Too much goes to union bosses, too much goes to the administration, not enough to the teachers and to the students. As far as Mr. Michaud and renewable energies, I have to respond to this. Mike, I love renewable energies. It's not ready. For the next 10 to 15 years, we have to have an interim. We have to go to natural gas. Now, you say your party is all about offshore wind and solar. Now, if you take Rock Mountain in, in Mars Hill, it's got 26 turbines up there. In order to replace only the power that is at Bucksport right now, 290 megawatts, you need to put up 27 of those Mars Hill mountains at a cost of $2.3 billion. Gentlemen, I'm and gonna have to cut you off here. We're nearing the end of our time, believe it or not. Okay. And I, I do wanna get in a few more questions that these require simply a yes or no answer. We're gonna get through as many as we can. Uh, we'll call this the lightning round. We'll start with Elliot Cutler and we'll go around. Can you ever see yourself supporting legalization, taxation, and regulation of marijuana for recreational use? I can see it, but I'm not ready to do it. Governor? Uh, through a referendum, yes. Congressman? No, I have a concern with it. Uh, Governor, would you sign a bill requiring businesses to provide mandatory sick time? No. Congressman? I'd provide, yes. Mr. Cutler? I'd do it as part of an insurance pool. Congressman, do you support uh, requiring background checks on the private sales of guns? if there's an exemption for family members. Mr. Cutler? I wouldn't exempt family members. Governor? I guess I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, private Do sales of them. guns as opposed to buying from a gun dealer, should there be background checks? Well, we'd have to change the main constitution, and I'm willing to do that if uh, we can get a referendum to pass it. May I say? Quickly. Yeah. Family, when I say, when he said family, when the congressman said family members, uh, if it's immediate family members, yes, but distant family members, no. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cutler, would you sign a bill increasing the governor's pay above the current $70,000? Not mine, but I'd increase Paul's. <laughs> <laughs> governor? <laughs> uh, I think uh, the governor's state of Maine should, salary should be elevated. And I'll say one more thing. The uh, senior management in the state of Maine's salaries ought to be increased. We, it's very, very difficult to find very capable and seasoned executives. Congressman, a pay raise for the governor? Uh, uh, for future governors. Uh, <laughs> a governor? Uh, not, not myself. The governor, actually, would you support, would your administration support building of a nuclear power plant in Maine? Yes. Congressman? No. Mr. Cutler? Not going to happen. Uh, Congressman, if Maine had ranked choice voting, which of your opponents would be your second choice? <laughs> Thank God we don't. <laughs> Mr. Cutler? 
I'd leave it blank. Governor? My wife. Good choice. Excellent choice. You can never go wrong with that answer. And with that, we'd like to uh, give each of the candidates a minute for a closing statement. We'll begin with Elliot Cutler. Thank you, Pat. My, uh, Governor LePage and Congressman Michel want you to believe that this election is just about Republican versus Democrat. It's not that simple. For those who love our state as much as I do, whose love is greater than the love for one party or the other, there is much, much more at stake. This election is about jobs and about our future, whether our kids, your kids, will be able to live and work and raise their families in the state of Maine. All of the assets and all of the resources that we need to succeed in a 21st century economy are available right here, right now. I'm going to be a leader with 21st century ideas. I'll be your governor. I'm not going to be bound to any special interests because I won't take their money. I'm not going to be obligated to them. I'm only going to be obligated to you. Whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent, I'm offering you a better way, not left, not right, but forward, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot Cutler. Uh, the Republican is the incumbent, Governor Paul LePage. Yeah. Liberals are really, really good at talking, talking, talking. I'm a businessman. I like to just get it done. This election is very clear. You have two liberals and one conservative. We can go backwards to the last 40 years and continue down that road, or we can continue to move forward and reinvent tomorrows. Because every man, woman, and child in this state deserves to carve out their piece of the American dream, as I have been so fortunate to do in this state. And I will tell you this. You don't become one of the best fiscal managers in, in 50 states by not understanding economics. In the last 10 days, 10, 12 days, we've been to many, many job openings and ribbon cuttings. You know, Maine voters, I'm not asking for all the votes, just yours. Come Remember, on. the major difference between my opponents and me, they believe that every day is April 15th. I believe it's July 4th. Governor LePage, thank you. And finally, the Democrat, Congressman Mike Michaud. Thank you very much. Uh, as the viewers have seen tonight, there is a very different vision for Maine's future here uh, this evening. And you've got a clear choice. You can either continue with the same divisive partisanship leadership style under our current governor that has kept Maine at the bottom of Forbes' uh, list as far as the place to do business, 47th as far as economic development, or you have a choice, a choice to move Maine forward in a positive way, focusing on our strengths as a state with small businesses, tourism, making Maine the food basket for New England, clean renewable energy, and having a stable budget process here. These are Maine's strengths. And I ask the voters of the state of Maine for your vote on November 4. Congressman Mike Michaud, thanks very much. Our thanks to all of the candidates for taking part tonight and to the Maine State Chamber of Commerce for hosting us. Over the next two weeks, we will bring you new center voice of the voter forums with the candidates for U.S. Senate and for Congress in the first and second districts. Stay with New Center for continuing election campaign coverage and election results and analysis and uh, after you cast your ballots on November 4th. Good night from the Augusta Civic Center.